And I guess while we wait, um, does anyone have questions about project related things? Um, I figure we can just uh, go over this a little bit while we're waiting for Manu, if there are any questions. I know I've seen a lot of teams getting started on their Discord, which is awesome. Um, what's the plan for what we're going to do at the lab on Friday? Um, so my understanding, Anton, you can correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is it's going to be a combination of um, taking apart uh, uh, some paper-based diagnostics um, and then someone from the lab, was it Anesta, that's going to run through a brief, I think, lab about other like various diagnostic tools. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, I think Anesta is going to um, do some like short sort of hands-on um, uh, yeah, demonstrations of the SNAP dx platform which she was one of the lead uh, developers of um so just kind of play around with some of the materials and what goes into that i'll actually message her about that right now and see and then beyond that i think i don't know how long these sessions will take but i expect the rest of it will just be um like open project work time if uh you know since it's a good time that all the teams should have free uh, just to, to go ahead and get started I'll check with Manu also. There was one mention of um, some project teams getting doing like a brief like project overview slash pitch just to discuss the like overall question that you know uh, your team is hoping to answer. Um, and I think this is a good way. Um, if we do end up doing this, this will be sort of a joint way of getting folks to start framing their problems. And then secondly, for folks um, that have not yet found a team, um, being able to you know take a look at everything that's out there and then join. Um, and we should have final, final teams uh, locked in by Monday. For those of you just joining, um, we're just waiting a couple minutes for Manu to jump off of a, a previous call. Um, but in the meantime, just talking, like answering any questions that you guys have on projects or course logistics or anything like that. So is today's Zoom just for people on site here or are there people jumping in um, from Zoom all over? We know. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Um, I think some folks are still jumping in from the global cohort. I know this time is a little bit tricky for a lot of folks that are in India. So, um, but but it, if if you're willing, Susan, I think this will be recorded so um, and, and posted online where everyone can see it. Sure. Um, if it's okay uh, with you, then then we'll do that so that the global cohort can see it as well. Good. Awesome. Any other project related questions um, for this Friday's deliverable? I guess we can just clarify. Um, I think we're hoping that we can get each team to be um, putting their notion page together and being able to very clearly articulate the problem and then like the scope of different solutions that you're looking at, uh, like sampling. I mean, that's partially where that Fred Park table that money was talking about in last class comes in um, is creating one of the, each of those or one of those for each of your projects um, so that everyone, I think folks, especially for, I know some of the groups that are doing like women's health related projects. Um, this will, I think, be able to, you know, a, a good way. I know there's multiple teams that might form around these ideas. Um, so it might be a good way to sort of like frame different solution spaces that you want to explore um, and, and how you might divide up the work there between two teams. And it sounds like my news just joining now. So we should be able to start in one second. Thanks for waiting. <laughs> 
Hey, Manu. Hey, everyone. Uh, sorry for running late. I realized I had to teach back to back and I am just finishing another class that was a guest lecture in another global health class. Um, <laughs> so really sorry for the delay, but I think uh, we should get started. And I think today is very special uh, because we have uh, someone from the class itself uh, teaching. And, you know, I'm very excited because this is really going to be uh, a deep dive into thinking about vaccines. So, um, you know, I think you all heard Susan the very first time she walked in into the room. It's really an incredible, uh, it makes me very happy, Susan, that you've engaged in the class because you know, it brings a very different perspective to these problems and the appreciation that how difficult and hard these problems are. So, you know, I think uh, it is very much a, a role model that you play uh, in this class itself. I'm going to pass it to you. And I think one of the things that we'll try doing today is both think about vaccines, but then also have a little bit of a discussion of what does it mean for biologics to be broadly available. So I think this is also true for some of the open source work that's happening in this space, but we'll really start first with vaccines as a discussion. So over to you, Susan. Uh, I think Tyler and Anton, I'm assuming you're recording this uh, because uh, this would be a really yes, fun, definitely. completely new content as well. So, uh, Hi. so Susan, I'll pass it to you. I'll mute my. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Manu. It's a treat for me to do this. Um, if there are questions while I'm speaking, just pipe in and ask them. Um, if you don't feel comfortable with that, maybe you can put them in the chat. But um, I'm not going to be able to watch the chat while I'm talking. So if Tyler and Anton can watch the chat and um, yeah, just jump in when there are comments or questions. Yeah, that sounds perfect. OK. So just, just a quick reintroduction. Um, I'm here as a fellow for this year, um, and I'm on the faculty in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Mount Sinai Medical School in New York. I'm an immunologist um, and uh, have been working in the HIV field and HIV vaccines um, and then, of course, in the last couple of years on COVID as well. So what I wanted to do was um, put these two pandemics in context of one another. Um, I am often questioned about why it is that we got a vaccine for COVID in a year, and it's been 41 years that we've uh, known about HIV and we still don't have a vaccine for HIV. So I want to put all these things together because I think one illuminates the other. So um, let's see uh, if, let's see, can you see the slides? That's better, right? Um, can you see the slides in full yes, view? So yes. It is okay. visible, but uh, we can we can see the presenter view right now. Um, uh, let's see. Well, um, maybe I'll just go back. Um, can you see that? Yeah, we can see that. Okay. I'll just stick with that for the time being. Okay. So, um, what I want to do, um, first is, um, compare the two pandemics and the comparison is pretty stark actually. Um, as I mentioned before, the HIV pandemic has been going on for 41 years, um, as opposed to the COVID for just two. The number of people infected in the 40 years is um, estimated to be 79 million people for HIV, but for COVID is 514 million, so a much greater infection rate in um, a much larger number of infections in a much shorter period of time. Um, in contrast, the number of deaths due to HIV, this was since the beginning of the AIDS pandemic, is 36 million 
versus 6 million in COVID. The time that it took the scientific community to isolate, identify and isolate the HIV virus was two years, as opposed to three weeks for COVID. The three weeks for COVID has a lot to do with all the things that we have learned from HIV research and other types of research in the past 40 years. So um, this is really a, a call out, shout out for the um, importance of basic research um, to, um, in terms of affecting um, public health and, and global health. Um, the number of doses of vaccines delivered for HIV is zero, whereas the number and counting for COVID is 11 and a half billion doses. So they're just huge contrasts and huge differences from the beginning um, to the present time um, when you're looking at these two um, pandemics. Some additional um, HIV statistics that are probably useful is that currently there are about 40 million people globally who are living infected with HIV. About 20 million people um, are able to access the antiviral um, therapies. So approximately two thirds of people who are infected can access um, the antiviral drugs for HIV. Um, and um, one and a half million people are becoming newly infected with HIV um, every year. Um, so, you know, HIV may not be in the headlines anymore, but uh, one and a half million people a year being infected is, is pretty dire and um, very troubling um, and underscores the need for vaccine. Well, there are some good, there is some good news um, about, <coughs> excuse me, about the HIV epidemic. And that is that the deaths um, are decreasing over time, um, as you can see on um, the left. Um, and I'm sorry, on, on the right. And the new infections are also decreasing. Um, so the deaths are certainly decreasing because of the availability of, um, of antiretroviral drugs um, and the fact that um, the majority of people who are infected have access to them now, um, which is very different than it was a decade or two decades ago. Um, and the number of cases are decreasing because prevention measures um, are, are taking hold um, in some countries more effectively than others. But globally, the rate of infection is, is going down. So, um, Susan, just, yep. just this, when I look at the, I think it's the second uh, death plot, I'm seeing, is that correct? Are we seeing a plateau there in terms of that the gains have been made and now it's flattening out the curve? Um, it's, the, this is the curve on the right. That's correct. Yeah. Well, it's coming down. The slope is still coming down. And you can, can you see those two yellow dots here? I don't know that the other one may be off the screen. Let me see if I can push it there. So this is the projection for the number of deaths in 2025, I think that is. So it is continuing to decrease. So we haven't hit we haven't hit a plateau, no. But the decline is much slower than it was um, earlier, and this is, of course, when the um, um, the global um, programs for the introdu introduction of antiretroviral drugs really got underway and in a global way. Um, okay, so so the tra trajectory for the HIV pandemic is, is definitely going in the right direction. Now, if you look at the, um, the same sort of curve, this is for number of cases of COVID. Um, and this is, of course, the, um, this is the Omicron um, peak earlier this year. Um, it's very clear that we cannot project where we're going. 
we don't know whether we're heading for more peaks as the virus evolves. We'll talk about that in a minute. Or whether we're going to come down and we're going to have small waves um, periodically. Um, so there's no way at this point that we can project where we're going to be in six weeks, in six months, or six years um, in terms of, of uh, the COVID pandemic. There's another interesting comparison, and that is the difference in the global distribution of HIV versus, um, uh, versus COVID. So um, if you look on the left, the data are from 2019 for HIV cases. And you can see that the, the vast majority of, um, of HIV, of the HIV burden, is in the southern hemisphere, right? Particularly in Africa and, and worst of all, um, uh, South Africa. Um, compare that to the distribution of COVID, right? Where really the burden of disease, obviously it's global. But there's more in the northern hemisphere than there is in the southern hemisphere. Um, so the distribution of, of these two diseases is, is tremendously different. Um, it's not at all clear to me, and, and somewhat of a surprise, that Africa has not been more hard hit by COVID. And there's a lot of um, conjecture about that which we don't really understand at this point. But but certainly, you know, if you look at Africa and HIV and Africa and COVID, it couldn't be more different. So that's sort of a, just an overview of the two pandemics on, on a global level. And so now what okay. I'd like... Suzanne, just sure. one more question on just that distribution. Sure. What I find surprising is when you do a comparison between Africa and India, and so when we think about the delta wave in India and the catastrophic outcomes of that, so this is just the infection rates, right. but then the outcomes can still be very different just because of the constraints around. That's and correct. And so is there a similar analogy between for HIV between Africa and India to compare? Um, in terms of outcome? Yeah, outcomes or the prevalence i mean i'm seeing india the numbers are lower and uh but again the uh, you know the outcomes mirror while in covid for example i would have thought a lot of things that happen in india might also play out in high density areas in africa and they didn't um it some of this has to do with reporting right mm -hmm. So reporting of cases, whether we're talking about HIV or COVID, is better in some countries than in others, right? Um, it has to do with locality. Um, uh, so um, the outcomes, obviously, in places that have good health care facilities and outreach is going to be much better than the localities where the outreach is poor or the infrastructure is is lacking. So some of the questions that you're asking have to be answered on a very granular basis, and it's hard to um, make a general statement about them. Um, okay. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about the, the virus, the viruses that um, are causing these two pandemics. So first, let's talk about HIV. So they're basically, they're two different kinds. Well, they're two different global um, categories of viruses, the RNA viruses and the DNA viruses. Within each of those categories, there are many different families with many, many differences. Um, but I just want to point out that HIV is an RNA virus, but it is an RNA retrovirus. So what does retrovirus mean? Well, in biology, as I assume probably everybody on this call knows, um, the sequence of um, expression goes from DNA um, to RNA 
and the RNA encodes for protein, right? Retroviruses are unusual viruses in that they start out as RNA viruses, and then they have, <coughs> excuse me, once they infect the cell, they have an enzyme that will go backwards, basically retro transcribe the RNA into DNA. And at that point, the DNA from this particular virus can integrate um, or insert itself into the cellular DNA. And that, that becomes very important in, in the next point. So uh, HIV is an RNA retrovirus. It goes from RNA into DNA, then the DNA re-expresses expresses as RNA um, and then expresses the viral proteins. So um, because the DNA form of HIV can insert itself into the DNA of the cell, it becomes, the virus genome becomes a permanent resident in the DNA of the cell. And it can hide there for decades until that cell gets activated. And so this is a lifelong infection. And because the genome can hide there, it is very hard to, um, if not impossible, um, to cure this infection, okay? Um, another point that's really unusual and very important about HIV is that that very enzyme that converts the RNA into DNA, it's called reverse, trans, reverse transcriptase, um, that enzyme is very error prone. So it makes lots of mistakes. And because it makes lots of mistakes, it leads to tremendous diversity in the virus. And we'll look at that in a minute. And that becomes a major stumbling block in terms of um, developing a vaccine. So, yep. Uh, yeah, one thing I've always been curious about with, with these viruses is that, um, that that hiding aspect, right? Is there any insight on like why sometimes it takes weeks to present symptoms versus like years for others? Um, so, um, we know that in certain cases it has to do with the genetics of the host. Um, it also has to do with the rate at which the, the virus basically destroys the immune system um, of the host. Um, and because that, the HIV infects the, the very cells of the immune response. We'll talk about that in, in a little bit. Um, but it destroys the very cells that the body uses to eliminate viruses. And that doesn't happen all at once. It's a gradual process. Actually, what happens is the HIV virus dysregulates the immune response um, and sort of eventually turns the body against itself. So it's not an acute process. It's a gradual chronic process. Thanks. Okay, some other questions? No, okay, um, keep them coming. Um, okay, so let's take a look at the SARS-CoV-2 virus, also referred to as COVID-19. So SARS-CoV-2 is severe respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. The first one was SARS. Um, that you may remember caused um, a small pandemic, but limited pandemic um, in 2003. Um, and um, just like um, with HIV, the virus is HIV and the disease is called AIDS. Um, SARS is the virus and COVID-19 has become the name for the disease. So I'm going to use SARS-CoV-2 and, and COVID-19 interchangeably. So coronaviruses are also RNA viruses, but they're not retroviruses. Okay. 
So um, they get into the cell and like all viruses do, they convert the cell machinery, a lot of the cell machinery to its own purposes in order to replicate itself. But it never goes backward into DNA. It doesn't get into your genome, into your DNA. And it causes an acute infection rather than a chronic infection that HIV causes. So it turns out that um, SARS-CoV-2 is one member of a family of, of viruses called coronaviruses. And um, first cousins of SARS-CoV-2 are um, some of the viruses that cause about 30% of the common cold. Like all living things, um, viruses evolve and SARS-CoV-2 evolves too. Um, what you have to do is think about viruses, and particularly this one, um, from the virus's point of view. So what does the virus want to do? It just wants to make more of itself. And um, if, it, if it makes more of itself, but it kills its host quickly, then it's not going to be able to um, infect lots and lots of people because the person it's infected is going to get very sick and die very quickly. And that's what happened in the SARS epidemic of 2003 and why it was so limited, because it was very pathogenic and it killed its hosts. So it was very transmissible, but people got so sick quickly um, and um, basically went to bed. Um, and if they didn't transmit the disease um, in that short period of time before infection and, and, and disease, then it didn't get spread efficiently. And that's why the 2003 SARS was pretty much a, a self-limited um, pandemic. Um, so from the virus's point of view, what it wants to do is become more and more transmissible and less and less pathogenic. And that's exactly what we've seen with COVID-19. Um, uh, the um, infectivity of the Omicron variant, the one that hit us in December and January, the infectivity was at least three times more than the original um, uh, COVID-19 virus, but it caused, in general, caused milder disease. Um, so uh, the virus is evolving in a way that we would expect it to evolve, um, and we hope it will keep going like that, but, um, but there's no guarantee. Um, so, Su Susan, yeah. on that front, could you say yeah. a word about Ebola in that picture? with very high quick mortality? And then are there strains of Ebola that are highly infectious and less lethal? Just where does that fit into this between the trade-offs? So I'm not an Ebola expert, but um, my understanding is that that is not the case with Ebola. And partly that's because the, the world has really been able to limit the Ebola virus. Um, spread, right? And the, I think it's reintroduced periodically from from bats in the wild, um, in in particularly in West Africa. So, but, but what I meant to ask was that this paradigm that you said about high mortality leads to the virus not escaping. Now, in the case of Ebola, the efforts have been also very important and very quickly uh, built up. And was, how does that play with this fact that the mortality rates were quite high as well? So what I'm trying to really say is Ebola arises from time to time, but does it have a potential to be a global threat uh, in the same way? And um, is that taken? I mean, I guess there is this notion of people are always planning for it. But how much of the success in Ebola is the credit to the work that we did versus the fact that it was potentially a self-limiting virus because of the infectivity mortality numbers? Um, I am not aware that they, and I, I, I 
can't state this with absolute fact, okay? But I am not aware that we have seen an evolution of Ebola. I think that what we're seeing is just sequential introductions of, Ebo of the same Ebola into small pockets of population. So we haven't seen that evolution. Okay. Um, okay. One so, more, sorry, yep. One, one more sure. question, uh, kind of a similar spirit, um, where viruses, uh, it seems like they, they tend to become less deadly as they evolve. Are there any cases where that's not true that you can think of, or is that fairly unusual? Well, um, I don't think that we've seen that with measles. Um, and certainly measles, you know, I mean, measles have been spread all around the world before and, and was very deadly introducing it into adult populations by explorers. Um, so I'm not, I'm not aware that that's happened with measles. Um, it, it sometimes it becomes rather complicated because um, with polio, um, and this is true with um, COVID as well, um, sometimes the, um, the same virus will cause relatively minor symptoms in one individual and very severe um, symptoms in another individual. And that's probably a function of many, many different factors um, that go all the way from the genetics of the infected individual to other um, uh, medical conditions that the host may have. It may have to do with the load of virus that you're inoculated with, um, you know, when you breathe it in. Um, so there are probably many factors um, that contribute to the level of disease, the level of pathogenesis in any one individual. So um, I, there are certainly examples where the virus does not evolve, um, but in the case of influenza, HIV, and COVID, and I'm going to show you that in a minute, um, there's um, very clear um, evidence of evolution. All right, so that's, yep. Another question? Nope. Okay, so the next slide. So, um, okay, so that's the perfect segue. All right. So um, if you look at, um, this is a, a phylogenetic tree of HIV in one year um, showing how it has evolved globally. And don't worry about the units, it's just we're looking at the relative um, um, diversity of the virus um, in one year. And, and you can see that the level of diversity of HIV, because of that error-prone um, enzyme, is enormous and um, as compared to influenza. So um, as you know, we have to get a different flu vaccine every year, and that's because of the evolution of influenza. But flu is absolutely nothing <laughs> compared to HIV. Now, if you do the same comparison between HIV and COVID, here's HIV on the right this time, and COVID is that little tiny dot over there in red. Now, I grant you this; these data um, on COVID were from 2020 in Southeast Asia. So at that point, you know, we only had the one strain. But still, um, given even given the variants that we've isolated recently or in the last two years, the amount of um, evolution, the amount of diversity in, in SARS-CoV-2 is minuscule compared to what we get in HIV. So what we had the original COVID, which we'll call alpha, and then we had the beta and delta um, and gamma. So, you know, and then Omicron and the Omicron variants, you know, so there, 
there are a handful of variants that have, have successfully spread around the country, uh, around the world. But as you can see, HIV spreads tremendously. Um, uh, I'm sorry, is, is the diversity of HIV is, is tremendous. Um, and as I said before, that diversity creates one of the huge problems in developing a vaccine. We'll go into that in a few minutes. Yeah, Susan, I just want to make a comment here. It's, uh, you know, I've thought quite a lot about what was happening in COVID diversity. I had never seen these two plots together. This is such an incredible illustration of different trajectories. I mean, we had thought that uh, we have it bad with SARS-CoV-2 from a diversity point of view. This is a remarkable representation. It really opens our eyes to what potential other viruses might have with the combination of transmission. Yeah, I, I tried to find one that was published after 2020, and I haven't found one yet. But yeah. it, it's still going to be very, very small compared yeah. to HIV. Um, OK, so um, next slide. Um, uh, this is so yeah, ju ahead. just while we're on it, and sure. this is a very cynical kind of a view. Does this also mean that the potential, you know, we often think about the worst case scenarios and pandemics. Just from viral biology itself, there exist many more worst case scenarios in rapid evolution, as fast as HIV, low mortality as COVID-2, high transmissibility as COVID-2. So we have not hit the worst case combos yet, even in history, possibly. And, you know, I think that one of the worst case scenarios, if you want to, if you want to go there, is I, th I think it's worth it's worth going there because of what happened in the last two years. The, the worst case scenario that I can think of is if HIV had been um, spread by a respiratory droplet infection. Because there you have a virus that that would be a virus that would be highly transmissible. It takes a long time between infection and the development of symptoms. So a long time when it could be um, transmissible and the host wouldn't even know that he or she was trans transmitting it. And you would have this tremendous diversity at the same time. I mean, that's really your grand slam nightmare. Um, so. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think at least some people on this call should not sleep. That really is something that we should be thinking about in the context of the future and why many of these tools and technologies, including diagnostics and vaccines, have to be made. You know, we have not seen the worst case. No, that's is there, this is, a, yeah, is there any reason why um, that couldn't happen? Like, our, our let's say, one transmission mode for, and, and like having a retroviral virus are those in any way mutually exclusive or are we just lucky i think we're just lucky so far i don't i don't see any reason why such a beast couldn't happen um okay any more nightmare scenarios you want to come up with um, okay, so um, just another, um, before we get into vaccines per se, just wanted to talk for a minute about the vaccine, um, uh, I'm sorry, about the, the virus variants. Now, we don't refer to them as, as variants in, in terms of HIV, but I'll use that term because it's the one that, that you're most familiar with, and it's just a matter of nomenclature. Um, but this is a distribution of the different variants of HIV around the globe. So in the U.S., South America, and Europe, and Australia, the um, B variant um, predominates. Um, in um, Eastern Europe, across Russia, um, and, um, and around the Baltic, it's, um, it's clade A. Um, China is mostly a combination of B and C. Um, India is 
um, subtype C or variant C. Um, South Africa is uh, a subtype variant C, and Africa has everything. Why does Africa have everything? Because the introduction of HIV from um, non-human um, non primates, mainly from chimpanzees, happened in um, Central West Africa, and it spread from there. So you can find everything in Africa. And, and what happens is that um, it's called the founder effect. So the first, as an example, a first um, virus that took off in South Africa happened to be uh, subtype C, whereas the first um, virus um, spread in the United States happened to be um, variant B. And, and then it's a founder effect. It spreads from there. Um, some of, something that's very clear here is you can see that subtype C is in South Africa and in India. Why in South Africa and India? Well, there's a fair amount of trade between South Africa and India. So you can trace um, a, a large amount of um, the variation um, in the HIV subtypes. Um, to trade routes and um, other routes. For instance, so much of Russia is from um, Central South um, Africa because so many, uh, it was introduced into Russia probably by students from um, that part of Africa who were studying in Russia. Now this is an entirely different picture than what you get with, um, with COVID where you have, you know, the, for instance, the Omicron um, virus that was in South Africa, identified in, in South Africa on uh, the third week in November. Um, and I was infected with it two weeks later in New York City and it spread all around the globe. So what you see um, is a global, very fast global spread of, uh, of, of the coronavirus um, SARS-CoV-2, um, as opposed to this founder effect um, that you see with HIV, which is because the spread is much slower. Um, okay, and um, so making our way towards development of, of vaccine, let, let me just talk for a minute about the surface protein spike on the outside of HIV on the left and SARS-CoV-2 on the right. The viruses are about the same size, um, and each one of the spikes on the surface is made up of three copies of, of protein, of, so three identical proteins that form the spike. Um, and this spike is responsible for getting the virus onto the surface of a cell. And that spike docks with a receptor on the cell surface, so only cells that have the receptor for that particular spike will get infected. So HIV and, and COVID-19 dock to different receptors, and so they infect different types of cells. Now, if you take a closer look at these spikes, um, you see the um, HIV, um, these are actually um, uh, actual, electron, um, uh, the, the cryo-electron images and then modeling of the spike on HIV on the left sitting on the surface of the, of the um, virus particle. And on the right, the virus particle would be in the same orientation and um, the spike of COVID is on the right. And if you look up here, can you see my cursor? Um, at where this red arrow is pointing, this is called the receptor binding domain. It's the part of the spike that binds to the cell, to a receptor on the cell. And you can see it's sticking up. It's very available. Um, the immune system can see it easily. And um, if you use a, a vaccine, we'll get to that in a minute, antibodies can bind to that and block the um, interaction between the virus and particularly the interaction between this spike and the receptor on the cell. 
Now that's not true with the spike on HIV. Um, there, um, the, these blue spheres represent sugars that are covering the protein spike. And, oops, sorry. <laughs> Um, and um, let's see, okay. And um, these, uh, these sugars cover up the receptor binding areas on, um, on the HIV spike. Now, the, there's a little cheating going on here because in fact, um, there's sugars here that are not shown as they are here. But even the sugars that are covering this part of the COVID spike don't cover this receptor binding domain. So we really got lucky um, in terms of COVID because this is the critical site of vulnerability of the virus and it sticks out um, and it it induces a strong immune response, and that's why it was so easy to make a virus, uh, a vaccine against it. Oops, I keep doing that. In contrast, um, well, I'll fix that in a minute. <laughs> and in contrast, that's not the case with HIV. So, um, so Susan, just yep. on that front, could you just say a little bit about where is the receptor binding? Yep. Uh, Yep. pockets on the HIV side. And then also, uh, I was just wondering how generic is, there are so many coronaviruses, how generic is this S protein sticking out? So in future, the fact that we got this vaccine quickly, what is its impact in other, other pandemics and other respiratory borne viruses like uh, coronas? So um, I didn't include any information about the variation in the um, in the spike proteins of the different variants. So um, what you know is that the vaccines that we have now um, were helpful in reducing the severity of the infection with Omicron, for instance, but it didn't prevent Omicron infections, and that's due to amino acid changes and mutations. Um, both in the receptor binding domain and other areas of the spike. Um, on the other hand, we had pretty good um, what's called cross-reactivity between the original variant um, and the, the Wuhan strain um, and, and the, um, um, the South African strain and the Brazilian strains that came after. So, excuse me, the, uh, there's some very interesting science about what the evolution has been of the different variants. Um, and we can explain that why the Omicron escaped um, the vaccines um, that we had. Um, that gets to a point that I'll come to in a minute that um, has to do with the two arms of the immune response, the antibody response and the cellular arm of the immune response. And I'll, I'll just give you a heads up before we get there. The cellular arm of the immune response that I'll explain in a minute um, does recognize all of the variants. And that's why even though um, a person who is immunized could get infected with Omicron, they didn't get that sick because the cellular arm of the immune response mopped up the infection before it could spread beyond the upper respiratory tract. Um, uh, we can go into that in more detail another time. Okay, so um, Manu, you asked about what are the sites of vulnerability on, um, on the HIV um, protein spike. They're um, uh, shown here in different colors. I remove the labels of what they are because that's really not important. But as if, if you look at this um, sort of uh, magenta area here, this is called the CD4 binding domain. This is, um, this is the area um, of the spike that binds to the receptor CD4 on the surface of lymphocytes. And if you look at this, that area is right in here, 
and it's pretty much covered up with sugars. And it turns out that you can make antibodies that will see, you know, parts around it. But it turns out that the antibodies that need to get in there, there, there are two problems. One is that, um, that the really critical part is down in a canyon. So the antibody has to get into the canyon. And in order to get into the canyon, it has to come straight in. If it comes from the side, it can't get there. Right, so HIV is a very, very smart virus in that it is covered up all of the sites of vulnerability um, uh, and um, it really makes it very, very hard to protect against or to make a, a, a vaccine against. Okay, so um, uh, I, I, am I going to? That, am I going no, I just to? Just on that. No, no, this is perfect. This is, I think this is valuable to just really deeply understand the, you know, often enough people, you know, think about that, oh, it's a market is different. But actually, you know, the fact that it's a scientific barrier is just fantastic. Just going on this front, what can we learn from the receptors that do actually bind to this in terms of thinking about the, uh, analogous receptors on the cell side. I mean, they do find this pocket. Uh, what do they do that's different from what you might want to look for from a vaccine perspective? How much of that is useful in any way? So um, in terms of HIV, um, one of the things that I haven't talked about is, you know, when I show you pictures, it's a static picture, but proteins are not bricks they move um and um hiv is particularly fascinating well all viral proteins are actually sort of trigger mechanisms um and often what you get is binding to a receptor that triggers the protein to change completely in its conformation and it's that triggered conformation that actually inserts into the membrane of the cell it wants to infect. So um, with HIV, there's actually two triggers. And one of those triggers causes a conformational change, causes a shape change that then exposes, so I can show you that better here. Um, um, uh, so th there's this area, which I'd call the CD4 binding um, domain. And then there's this area up here at the apex of, remember this is made of three different proteins. And it's at the apex of the, the three of them. And it turns out that when this area binds to the receptor on the cell called CD4, it causes a tremendous change in the shape of this trimer and it opens up almost like a flower and that exposes um, surfaces up here at the apex that are closed here but it opens up and then as a result of that opening it can um, attach to the cell so there's a lot of moving parts literally moving parts here and the um, and, and that's a way that the virus has protected itself. Um, that it, you know, it, it's going to keep. I, I always think of this as the business end of the molecule. It's going to keep the business end of the molecule closed until the last possible minute when it gra grabs onto the cell. And therefore, antibodies that are to that region up here. There may be antibodies, there are antibodies to this region, but they don't have time to get there. So um, it's, um, it's a movie, you know, it's, not, it's not a snapshot. Okay, so, um, all right, so the interim conclusions, the summary of what I've said so far is that HIV is a retrovirus. Once it gets into your cells, it's a lifelong resident. In contrast, SARS-CoV-2 causes an acute infection 
and can be eliminated by the immune system. HIV is spread by sexual contact and blood. SARS is transmitted through the air. HIV is extremely error prone, leading to huge diversity, um, while SARS-CoV-2 evolves, but at a much, much slower rate. And the vulnerable sites of the HIV envelope protein that can be recognized by the immune system are covered up and do not induce a strong immune response, whereas the vulnerable site of SARS-2 spike is highly accessible to the immune system and induces a very strong immune response. Okay, so finally, <laughs> vaccines. Um, all right, so the only feasible tool that we have for controlling epidemics is with a vaccine. Vaccines induce an immune response that prevents infections. It's important to remember that most vaccines don't need to prevent infection. They can allow infection but prevent disease. That's the case with polio. If you're immunized against polio, you can get infected with polio, but you will not get paralyzed. You will not die. And we've seen that vividly with COVID, right? So um, one of the problems with HIV vaccines is that once you're infected with HIV, it's in you. You can't get rid of it. So for an HIV vaccine, you need to block infection entirely. It's called sterilizing immunity. That is very, very hard to achieve. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do is, so vaccines, as I said, induce an immune response that prevents infection. So let's talk about the immune response, okay? So the immune system, and this may be repetition just, for just many. A quick, just a quick question, Suzanne, just before the, I think you said something on the context of thinking about uh, for HIV, uh, when the person is infected, they are transmissive for life. And so the context of a, if a vaccine protects a severe disease in them, it is not as effective as compared to say polio or COVID in which the vaccine prevents a severe disease in them, but does not change the rate of transmission. Like I, I'm just trying to figure out, is that because that the body eventually clears out COVID and you're not a lifetime transmission while in this case, it's a permanent, right. anybody infected is a permanent emitter of viruses. Right, if they're not treated, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, and treatment does lower the transmission counts. Very much so, very much so. And, and so in the absence of a vaccine for HIV, there's this whole area that's called um, treatment as prevention. Because if you mm -hmm. treat individuals who are infected, it reduces their viral load down to undetectable, and then they're yeah. not infectious. Yeah. And I remember many of the arguments in the community were played out when many of the drugs were so expensive that there is still deep value, otherwise it will just keep spreading. Right, right. So yeah, treatment as prevention is our best tool now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the immune system, um, um, I, I, this is just a cartoon of the major organs of the immune system um, and um, you know the the lymph nodes um, tonsils and adenoids are part of the lymphoid system um, spleen your gut has um, lymphoid tissue in it called pyrus patches the bone marrow is full of uh, it's a very important site um, and it is full of lymphocytes um, and other cells that are involved in immunity excuse me, and the cells, um, the, the cells that are involved with the immune system, as well as the antibodies, which are um, the soluble um, molecules, proteins that are part of the serum um, of uh, the, the, the cells um, are suspended in, in, in your blood and uh, lymph, lymphoid system. Um, 
they circulate everywhere. So they're in blood and in your skin. So basically, your whole body is part of the immune system, right? And um, why? Because um, the immune system has developed to protect you against outside invaders, and it needs to be everywhere, and it needs to be active all the time. So um, as I alluded to um, a few minutes ago, there are two um, there there are two major parts of the immune system: the innate arm of the immune system and the adaptive arm of the immune system. So the easiest thing in terms of the innate immune system is maybe to think about getting a splinter, right? You you get the splinter and your or or you get a scratch and you know your body recognizes that there's something foreign there and it it. Um, inflammation occurs. So you get, you know, some some heat and some redness around that and some cells that will gather there um, and try and eliminate this foreign particle. And those cells become pus, which is part of an infection. And this is the um, innate immune system that's trying to eliminate that, that foreign body. And that is a, a, a system that goes way back um, in, in evolution. Um, you find it in invertebrates. The adaptive immune system didn't um, really develop until you get to the uh, cartilaginous fishes like um, sharks. Um, and um, it, what do I mean by adaptive? Adaptive means that the first time you see um, let's say a virus, um, you will get infected with it. And then assuming that you can clear it, your, your immune system remembers that it saw it. It has been taught by its first interaction um, that there is this virus that it recognizes as foreign. And immunologic memory um, occurs so that the next time you see that particular virus, um, you you won't get infected again. And that's typical of measles, right? Once you get measles, you're not going to get measles again. And it's um, it is that arm of the immune system, the ad uh, the adaptive arm, which is responsible for protecting you against infections. And it's that arm of the immune system that you want to um, stimulate with vaccines. So um, your body is not born knowing that uh, it can defend itself against measles. You have to see measles. Or you have to see the measles vaccine for your body to adapt, for your immune system to adapt um, and learn um, how to protect itself against measles. And once it's learned it, it doesn't forget it lifelong memory. So then there are two arms within the adaptive immune um, system. One is a cellular compartment and the other is a humoral or soluble um, components. Um, and the soluble components are antibodies and happily after two years of COVID, I think we all know what antibodies are. They're proteins that very specifically will recognize, for instance, the spike um, on the COVID-19. They're made by lymphocytes, uh, white blood cells, the type of white blood cells that you can divide into different categories. And these are called B lymphocytes, the cells that make antibodies. And they're called B lymphocytes because um, you find them in the bone marrow and um, and you can remember B lymphocytes make antibodies. The cellular arm of the immune response is um, uh, is made up of several types, again, of lymphocytes. These are called T lymphocytes because they originally come from the thymus, which is an organ that's um, in, in your neck or, or near your thyroid. So these are T um, lymphocytes because they they originate in the thymus. Um, okay, so just a very simple introduction to um, the immune system. Um, what happens is that if something foreign comes into your body, like a virus, 
Um, it will be presented um, to what are called helper T cells. Those are the T lymphocytes I was just talking about. One category of them is called helper T cells. And these cells um, secrete a variety of chemicals, proteins, um, that help T cells develop into um, a different kind of T cell called the killer T cell. And the killer T cells can recognize specifically cells that are infected with that virus, not another virus, just this one. The immune system is very, very specific. Okay, so you get the virus stimulating helper cells, causing proliferation and maturation of these killer T cells that can mop up an infection um, of infected cells. Um, the helper T cells will also um, secrete proteins that will stimulate B cells. Those are the cells that you find primarily in the bone marrow, but there are in all the lymphoid organs as well. And it's the B cells um, that make antibodies, secrete the antibodies, and the antibodies then very specifically will recognize that virus, not another virus. And um, when it binds to the antibody, there are a number of ways that it kills the virus particle, okay? So a general rule of thumb is that antibodies can bind to viruses and prevent infection. But the cells, the killer T cells, cellular immunity, kills and eliminates infected cells. So you really need to stimulate both arms of the immune response to have an effective vaccine. But the cells don't recognize the virus. The cells only recognize, the killer T cells only recognize cells that are infected with the virus. If you want to stop a virus from coming in, you need antibodies. So um, uh, there's a, a lot of emphasis on um, antibody production by vaccines. And in fact, all of the, um, I would say all of the vaccines that are used um, clinically, um, we know that, that, that their efficacy is associated with, with the presence of antibodies. Um, okay, so, okay, so um, we already went through this. All right, so. All right, so that, that brings us back to um, the spike on coronavirus and this receptor binding domain on the spike, which is what binds to the receptor on the, um, on the surface of cells, that, many different types of cells uh, that can be infected by coronavirus. Um, and um, this spike protein was used to construct a vaccine. So what, what happened was, you know, within three weeks, we had the, um, we had the sequence of this virus. This virus was um, um, identified and through a series of steps that we won't go through now, it was became very clear very early on that this was the site of vulnerability on the uh, coronavirus. And as a result of that, very quickly, um, several labs and companies um, were able to um, generate um, the messenger RNA um, vaccine that was uh, put out by Pfizer and Moderna. Another way of making the vaccine was to make a recombinant adenovirus vaccine. So adenovirus is another virus that causes mild diseases in humans, um, you know, conjunctivitis, sort of cold-like um, um, symptoms. And you can, um, with molecular techniques, you can take a virus and you can plug a protein from a different virus into it. Um, and so the Johnson & Johnson vaccine took the spike of coronavirus and made a recombinant adenovirus vaccine. Um, and that was used, although there were a number of problems with that vaccine. Um, and then there's a new vaccine that's coming on the market from Novavax that is just made up of this protein alone. Um, that's the way most conventional vaccines have been made, like when you get tetanus, for instance, or you get the tetanus toxin. 
um, it's been detoxified. But most conventional vaccines are just using a protein to immunize you. So that one's coming down the pike rather soon. So just to look at how the mRNA vaccine works. So again, you, you identify the spike protein as being the site of vulnerability. And then through molecular techniques, you can make messenger RNA, which has instructions in it for making the spike protein. Um, you can do that in the lab, and then you can formulate that into a vaccine that you can give to people. Um, and when you get the shot in your arm, the messenger RNA gets into your cells. It, it gets primarily into muscle cells. It's given into the muscle in your arm. Um, it is designed um, to, for the messenger RNA to get into muscle cells. The muscle cells then make that protein, right? So here's the muscle cell that's expressing the RNA as the spike protein. Now the spike protein stimulates the T cells and the B cells in your body, and the B cells make antibodies. And now you have antibodies circulating in your blood, and if you get infected or if you get exposed to the virus, the antibodies will recognize that virus and eliminate them or kill them so that you don't get infected. So that's, that's the way the RNA um, vaccine works. Um, okay, so I'm getting towards the end here, I promise. Um, so what types of vaccines do we have? Well, I already, you know, we already talked about the mRNA vaccines. We have the recombinant viruses I just talked about. They don't cause disease, so non-pathogenic viruses. Um, and this was the J&J &J vaccine. We have live attenuated viruses. What's that? That's a virus that's alive, um, but it doesn't cause disease. So the Sabin polio vaccine that you take on a sugar cube or a drop in your mouth, the mumps vaccines are live attenuated virus vaccines. There are also killed virus vaccines. So the polio virus that was made by Salk that you get as a shot in the arm, that's a killed virus vaccine. And the influenza virus vaccine that you get every year um, is a killed virus vaccine. You can also, by molecular techniques, make something called a virus-like particle, where you can take many of the proteins of a virus, um, but eliminate the, the molecules, the DNA or the RNA that make them um, infectious. And you can make virus-like particles and use those as vaccines. And the human papillomavirus, or HPV vaccine, um, which present, prevents cervical cancer, is a vaccine that's made of uh, virus-like particles. Um, with certain bacteria in particular, you use carbohydrate-based vaccines. The one that's used to prevent meningitis is a carbohydrate-based vaccine. The protein-based vaccines, as I just mentioned, an example of that is tetanus. Um, DNA vaccines are being um, developed. We don't have any in clinical um, use yet. And, and with the mRNA technique, we may skip over the DNA vaccines. Um, and then you can use combinations of these. Um, so with um, some of the HIV vaccines that are being um, tested, um, they're being um, uh, they're constructed of recombinant non-pathogenic viruses together with a protein-based virus. So you can use combinations that are more effective or particularly effective at stimulating both the T cells and the B cells, which, which you need. All right, so the, the last, we're on the last leg here. So why is it so tough to make um, an HIV vaccine? Well, the first one we talked about is the huge virus diversity of HIV and the rapid evolution of the variants and the differential global distribution of clades. That's a fancy word for variants. Um, um, the vaccine that you need to, you either need to make a vaccine specifically for South Africa, 
or specifically for the U.S. Um, or you need, which doesn't really work because people move around and the virus moves around. Or you need to make a, a vaccine that's going to recognize all of the different variants of HIV. So that's uh, a huge hurdle. Um, a second aspect that makes it very difficult is we've already talked about the stealth nature of HIV. So the vulnerable sites of the virus are hidden. Um, they're, uh, they're hidden under the sugars. They're also hidden in canyons, as I, as I showed you. The envelope protein changes shape that we talked about, um, and that helps to hide the vulnerable parts of the virus until it's too late to get at them. Once the virus gets into the cell, it's there for life. And when it's integrated into the DNA, it is quiescent, so it is not making anything that would the immune system couldn't recognize to say there's something foreign there. So it's referred to as a latent infection, and, um, and the virus can hide out in that way from the immune system for prolonged periods of time. Um, and then lastly, and you know, we talked about this too, um, HIV infects the lymphocytes, the, the, specifically the T lymphocytes, which are the very cells that the body needs to eliminate the virus infection from the body. And lastly, um, um, the HIV um, is really very poor um, at generating an effective protective immune response. So we know, for instance, that if somebody is infected with HIV, they will mount an immune response to it. But if they get exposed to HIV again with a different strain, they can get super infected. They can get infected by two different strains. So it means that the human immune system is not good enough to protect itself. And it means that when we make a vaccine, we have to do better than nature is done. That's a tall, that's a tall order. Um, it's also particularly difficult to work on HIV vaccines because there are no animal models for, back, for HIV. Um, uh, some close relatives of HIV infect monkeys um, especially the great apes, but and they're called simian immunodeficiency viruses, but they are not exactly like HIV, so we don't have a good animal model. We can't study if this vaccine works in rabbits or in mice or guinea pigs, which makes um, doing experiments much harder. Um, uh, even if we can expose the vulnerable sites from the spike, um, they turn out to not be good at inducing a strong immune response. So the virus has figured out a way <laughs> that they um, to have those those vulnerable s spots there, but um, to make them weakly immunogenic. Um, and uh, and the vaccines that we've tested so far um, uh, prove this point. That, um, that the envelope itself is not a strong um, vaccine. So that is a very long <laughs> story, um, but um, I hope um, that without um, you know, a detailed course in immunology and virology, that um, this gives you an idea of why sometimes it's easy to make a vaccine and sometimes it's really, really tough. I just want to say, uh, Susan, I learned a lot. That was just absolutely fantastic. Uh, if you unshare your screen, it would be really fun for uh, if people can share their uh, images. We could just have a, a brief discussion, sets of questions. I have a few sets of questions around or, and thoughts in terms of thinking a little bit about uh, you know, access and cost of vaccines. But maybe, Susan, if one thread that, because I've spoken to a lot of folks in TDE, 
and BCG shots and this idea that, you know, there's nothing really good in that TV space itself. And again, from an impact, human impact perspective, just like HIV, you pointed out, are there fundamental barriers to to be vaccines very much like you described in HIV? Or is that, can that be taught in the context of funding and our, uh, what best to say, global priorities are well, not there yet? So no, I'm, yeah, I'm curious no, your thoughts on TB. Um, there, uh, it's really hard to figure out what the sites of vulnerability are on um, the tuberculosis bacterium. Mm-hmm. Um, there, are pre, there were a lot of pre, there were and are a lot of preconceived ideas about what protect, protects against tuberculosis, whether it's the cellular immune response or it's antibodies. And it not wasn't until maybe ten or fifteen years ago that people even started thinking about antibodies as a possibility, um, uh, as a protective possibility against TB. Um, uh, then that that idea is gaining some ground, but then identifying what the vulnerable s- spots are uh, in the TB bacterium. TB is particularly problematic, you know, because it's covered with this waxy substance, Mm -hmm. um, which protects it from the immune system. It also, um, once it gets into cells, um, or once it gets into an organ, it can um, form a shell around it and sort of protect itself for years and years from the immune response. Um, A third of the world is infected with tuberculosis. A third of the world. Um, So third of the world, just for everybody, is that one third of people on this call may have latent TB. I do. Yeah, and I do too. So (laughs) anybody who grew up in South Asia is most likely. So, I mean, the good news is that of the people who are infected with TB, um, there is a 5% lifetime chance that you'll develop clinical tuberculosis. But of course, if, you, if you're if you immunosuppressed for one reason or another, if you get HIV or you're getting chemotherapy, then your chances of, of um, the TB reactivating is very, very high. Um, and so there is a TB epidemic that is superimposed on the HIV epidemic. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I think uh, maybe there is one or two more minutes. Anybody else has kind of broader questions? Uh, uh, go ahead, Erica. No. Oh, Erica, you didn't have a question. Okay, did you? I saw a raised hand. No, okay. I guess, yeah, we will catch. Oh, Deborah, go ahead. Um, I just had a question about autoimmunity because I know with um, COVID, some, some people have gotten the reaction that it, they get some kind of an autoimmune syndrome and, and things are attacking themselves, right? right. Does that occur with some of the other um, viruses too? Well, let me answer the first part, and then I'll answer the second part. So what happens in severe COVID is not due to the virus. It's due to an over-exuberant reaction of the body against COVID, and, but it, it gets deregulated, and it, get, and, and it spins out of control. And in severe COVID and death, the 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 symptoms and the results are because the body has just made all of these pro, mainly proteins um, that drive the immune system sort of crazy and non-specifically and 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 let me just so let, let me just go back and and add one thing to that. Because the immune system is so powerful, its default 
setting is off. You do not want your immune system to be turned on except very specifically. And what happens in severe COVID is that everything gets turned on. And, um, uh, you know, why that is in some people and not other people, there are probably many factors to that. And then the second question is, oh, do some other viruses do that? Probably. I mean, there are, you know, there are autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis. And we don't know what causes that. And there are lots and lots of theories about it. But we think that many autoimmune diseases may be triggered by infection together probably with genetics. Um, and again, once part of the immune system is triggered on um, and can't be turned off, then you're in trouble. And that's what an autoimmune disease is. I have some experience with that from exposure to coal when I was a kid in London, which an immunologist later said kind of put end of the high, vi high fever virus for three weeks. And it caused this post-viral syndrome that takes years to, but I mean, viruses are just so interesting what they, what they do to you, right? <laughs> They're pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think one thing I wanted to do, uh, I'll do that in a little bit of a later session in a lecture, will be really around manufacturing technologies around viruses. I think many of you know the inequality around manufacturing, and there are some really interesting ideas right now, including temperature-sensitive vaccines, very frugal approaches of thinking about making a vaccine temperature stable because most of the mRNA vaccines can't be distributed globally. So uh, I think I'll do a little bit of that technology side of the story. Uh, the encapsulation part is very interesting. There is a class of fluidic technologies that are now online that could allow very low cost, very small scale uh, delivery platforms. And I think the third piece of that is also the policy front, which is what has happened after COVID in terms of thinking about what does vaccine manufacturing capacity look like outside the global north. Uh, there's a lot of interest in making sure that these platforms, I mean, it's incredible that we have all of these sets of technologies, but clearly even for solutions where they work very well, the access is a huge issue. So I think we'll kind of pick this up thread, but without this context, it would have been very hard to even talk about the technological side of it. Um, I think it's 1.45 at my end, uh, so it must be 4.45 yeah, at all of your end. Yeah. <laughs> it's 2 a.m. Yeah, I think what we'll do is we'll pick up and uh, we'll see you for the... Uh, lab meeting or the lab get together. And I think we'll try to do a little bit. I'll see how much reagents we might have to spare. I just talked to Nesta, we might really be out of reagents. But I think one thing we'll do is walk through a little bit of the manufacturing side. Please do bring some COVID tests to the lab. Uh, as many interesting tests as you can bring in that lab session, we'll be opening all of them. Make sure if it is a used test, then you are the only one using it. Don't consider that it is uh, inactivated. So don't borrow a friend's test, for example, uh, no matter what. Uh, but you can bring brand new tests because they are, uh, at least the RDTs are much more accessible and cheaper, if not cheap. Uh, but we will see you for a diagnostic session on Friday. Uh, and then I just have to say, I cannot thank you enough, Susan, for that phenomenal comparison. Just so much we have heard about COVID and still so little do we know and understand. And especially, uh, this is a good inspiration for folks in the room itself to run Teach Me Anything sessions because, you know, when we share knowledge, it only grows. So I really learned a lot. Thank you so much. Good. My pleasure. Bye. Bye, everyone. And then we have you in the class all the time. So we will now. Bye, everyone. Good night. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.
Thank you, Susan. You're the best.